Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second session in the webinar series on uh, using Historiana to teach history from different angles. Today, we will be talking about the, an activity developed using the content on Bologna and the universities that's available on Historiana. And here to talk to us about this activity and walk us through it is Heitz van Hans, who is a member of the Historiana teaching and learning team. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. I will present you with an activity that we have developed using some source collections of Historiana on the topic of medieval universities. So I am a teacher trainer in history and religious education at the Pontus University of Applied Sciences and a teacher trainer in religious education at the Amsterdam University in the Netherlands. So I, I teach two different subjects. And I am also uh, a part of the uh, teaching and learning team of, of Historiana. And we like to contribute to the work of Hero Clio. So I'm very pleased to be here with you uh, this afternoon. And we're going to discuss the rise of medieval universities, maybe to get a better understanding of the value of, of education. And in this case, of course, higher education for human society. Now, I would like to ask you which country I think so. North Macedonia, Vietnam, all right, Estonia, Belgium, Albania, the Netherlands, two people from Italy, one from Italy, but that's probably in Italy uh, as well. Okay, the Netherlands and Netherlands. Okay, so we have a, quite a, a, mixed, a mixed group of participants. So in the Historiana team, we have two different teams, the teaching and learning team, but also the content team. And the content team has been working for, for a number of years now on providing sources um, that you could easily use in your classroom situation. And there's a lot of different European heritage institutions that collect a lot of images, but also other sources that are ready to use. And, and our content team really tries to, to collect them, rework them in such a way that it provides a good source, but also a good narrative that you could use in the classroom. So the source collection that I will be using today has been made by our own content team. And you could find that on the Historia under the heading of historical content. What you will see in every source collection is just uh, if you select that uh, broad description of what the source collection is all about. And then if you scroll further down, you will see all these different pictures with some explanation of what is presented there and why it's relevant. And then you would get uh, a concrete source like this. So this source collection has 41 sources that you could use. There is an image and there is an explanation, uh, description of what the image is, is portraying, but also why it is relevant. So that is the source collections that we have. We have different source collections, all, almost all periods of history, all, though predominantly modern and pre-modern history, but, but also some medieval and ancient history as well. And you could easily download that in your own Historiana account and try to work that into, into an activity that would allow your students to study that by using online tools. So what I've done is I, wanted to use this collection to provide my students with information, but also with, with ideas to think about why did universities develop within the European uh, continent in the Middle Ages? What were the causes? Why were they relevant? And also, what was the effect of the studies done at these universities? And, and why are they still relevant today? Why is that development something that we should be proud of and, and, and try to, to protect such such higher learning facilities. So what I've done is I try to come up with first some simple design principles, right? So one of the things is I wanted to use only the sources from the source collection to provide a very relevant idea of a good example of how you would be able to use these sources. The, the, the Historiana tool allows you also to find your own sources on the internet. Even you might have some sources that you could digitalize and could use from your own library. The tool allows you to do that, but I wanted to present you with only the sources that were readily available. So that's the first design principle. The second principle is that I wanted an active role for the students and you were going to, to play the role of student in, in a short while, but I wanted students to participate. I did not want to have an activity where the teacher tells what happened and what we should learn from that. 
they wanted the students to discover it for themselves. And therefore, I wanted to also an interactive use of online tools. And we'll be using the Historiana e-learning activity builder and, of course, e-learning activity itself. I wanted also to use a program that would allow us to discuss these the answers students might have and their contributions also in a digital format, in digital context. Of course, coming from a period where we were in lockdown, such tools did help me to teach in my own teaching practice because I found that if I wanted to teach a class and, and it was only digital, that students could not concentrate for a long time. They, they really got absent within a few minutes, sometimes even. By using online tools to say, but you need to present your answers, you need to be connected. I was able to capture their, their concentration for a longer period of time. Students are engaged, they need to provide input, and therefore they have little chance to start daydreaming or do anything else. So that's the third design principle. Fourth one is I want to provide an e-learning activity that would uh, help us reflect on the usefulness of a historical understanding of having a, a, some kind of understanding of what happened in the past. So these four design principles were leading in what I tried to come up with. The goals I would have also with my own students, uh, I teach mainly students at at a bachelor program in, in history, but it's a teacher trainer program. So the students are about between the ages of 17 and, and 20, 22 years old. But I think this would also work in high school situation with slightly younger students. But at the end of the activity, I would love my students to be able to describe some of the causes of the rise of medieval university. And so why did they develop? What was the need that drove that? I would like them to describe some elements of the education at the universities. So how was the university life? What did people do? How did people study? Of course, I want to describe them some major effects of those universities on European cultural life. And in the end, I would be really happy if they would be able to reflect on the value of education for society and, and why we should keep investing in higher education or education in total. So those Four goals is something that I would like my students to be able to at the end of the activity. Now, one main historical thinking concept within this activity, something that I concentrated on, was historical significance. Right? And um, using mainly the ideas of, of Sykes and Morton in the big six historical thinking concepts, I am aware that something is historical significant if they result in change. So the relevance, the historical relevance of those universities, okay, but what what did they change in European cultural life? Or if they shed an enduring emerging issues in history, but this is not the case. The second part is that I was aware that historical significance is, is constructive. Something is not relevant per se. It's relevant because it takes a meaningful of a place in, in a narrative, right? So it's relevant to us because we think the changes that resulted from that were useful or actually the, the opposite. And so we needed also to place some of those events or some of the changes within a narrative. Uh, I have used a tool that would allow us to do so. And therefore, the idea that historical significance varies over time and from group to group is something that might be explored, but I will not be exploring that within this, this activity. So I had some design principles, I had some goals, and I had some ideas, okay, I need to incorporate some ideas of how historical significance works. And I work those ideas out into, in, into the activity. Now, if you go to the link that has been provided for the activity, you will probably see this activity. If you are able to open the link, you can explore the first page, but I want to, to show you what you'll be working with. It's a so-called discovery tool. So the discovery tool is a, is a very, I think a very handy tool to discuss or let students discover different connections between historical phenomena. So what you do is you start by clicking on one of the sources that are visible. And if you click one source, then you'll be able to discover all the connected sources. So I would like you to look at the first three slides and use the discovery tool. Just, just look at it and try to come up with the answer. And the first thing is what can we learn from the development of these universities, what needs did they fulfill? And if you have finished the discovery, if you look all through all the, the sources there is in the third page, there is an answer 
uh, a question you can answer. Now, I would suggest that you use the discovery tool. It's it's quite some sources. There are some also some instructions in in the source itself. And if you have finished that, I would like you to answer the question that is in the presentation tool. What need did the medieval university fulfill? So that's the first question I want you to answer by using the discovery tool. If, if... I, while we go over the sources in the discovery tool, I have a curiosity, which is partially based on the fact that I have used the discovery tool myself. And the curiosity is, did you use the descriptions of the sources that were already available in the source collection, or did you adapt the description of the sources in this case? No, because when I integrated the sources from the source collection, there was no description in the discovery tool. So I needed to, to add that because it, it didn't copy that. So I, I put my own description in there, yeah. Right, so you added the description, let's say, only in the sources that are key to answer the questions that you have asked. When you select the source and try to download it into the discovery tool, it gives a thumbnail, right? And you, you yeah. click on the thumbnail and the thumbnail itself doesn't have a source and uh, different connections also do not have a name. That I put in, but I see that most of the later sources that portray university life didn't give a description. That needed to be added because oh, okay. uh, the, the description that is in the source itself will be only be visible if you click the, on the source. Yeah. So if, if I click on the first one, for example, let me see, there is more tool, European trade routes, right? If you click on that, only then does the source provided by the source collection become visible. So the thumbnail yeah. is not the source itself. I asked because I know that with the discovery tool, you can create connection for the students to discover and you can use sources that you have added to your own sources on Historiana or sources that you have uploaded from your computer. And when you add the sources that you've saved from Historiana, you do have the possibility to also Im import the description, but truthfully, every time that I've seen it used, I've seen it used with new descriptions because you will want your description to be more aligned with the aim that you're using the discovery tool for. Yes, exactly. And, and of course, at the same time, by naming the connections, you also mm -hmm. use the sources in your own way. Yeah, exactly. And right. there's an interesting question from one of the participants who, who asked, do I have to go through all, all the nodes? And what I replied to this question, but of course I have not developed the activity was, well, you need to at least go through enough nodes to develop an understanding of what's the answer to the question. Yeah. But what do you think? I think that's that, that correct. You know, as far as it goes in historical reasoning, the more you know, the more information, correct information and knowledge you have, the better your argumentation your construction of history will be, your image of history will be. Of course, looking back, back on my own teaching practice, some students would like to get the safest or the quickest route to the answer, right? And they would probably say, okay, what do I need to provide a sufficient answer? But if you really want to understand history, then the more information you have, the more informed your image will be. Yeah. And at the uh, same time, everyone arrives to an answer from a different path. So I really, really like that in this mind map that you have created, there's three different starting points, you know, and with all of them, you can actually arrive to, to an answer that might or might not be correct. We will yeah. find out soon. Well, but, and at the same time, understanding that causal relations within history always are multi cause right? There's never one single cause. So if you call something like the rise of university, there's such a broad amount of factors that we need to take into consideration. And students should be aware of that. Okay, but there are different routes and all those routes are needed to understand why this development took place. And, and I think that, you know, the source collection has provided some of, of the causes, but not all the causes, because you, you could go provide different causes than, than are mentioned here. And that idea to under, let on the students, students understand, okay, but there's no thing that happened and therefore that happened. Okay, there's a lot of different things happening in Europe and then at one point universities just became something that, that people wanted. And why is that? And, and what different factors uh, we will take into consideration. And, and actually the, the next activity within the e-learning activity will shed some light on the high. But I agree with you that the discovery tool is a very helpful tool if you want 
students to explore a narrative because you, you provide a narrative yourself. It's the teacher who still provides a narrative, but because there are different pathways into the narrative, they can really explore the narrative from different angles, different perspectives, which would be great. And I, I would love to, to use the discovery tool by training multi-perspectivity. So there's a source collection that really provides different perspectives, different narratives or different views on the same development. I think it would be lovely to use the discovery tool to really let students explore that. Okay, but what are the differences? What are the points they have in common? Yeah, I think I've seen it used mostly show have students discover things at their own pace, hence the discovery tool. Another use that I've seen sometimes is I've seen it used to show processes. So for example, yeah. I've seen it used to show how from the industrial revolution we arrived to global tourism. And that also I think it's a very, very different use that you can make but it is quite yeah. interesting yeah and i think it's therefore it's a very good addition to to the entire activity build because i don't think we have had this for very long right a year year and a half i think so yeah yeah so it's a really very good addition just let students really understand processes or things like multi-perspectivity without using simple powerpoint and then it's it, it's, it's student pace the student really decides his own pace of working through the sources, through the ideas, instead of a, a single text that, that just will provide this is what you need to know, or even a lecture by a teacher. So if you haven't had the chance to view all the sources, uh, it's not a big problem, right? If you would be able, please provide uh, a preliminary answer to the question. They provided education itself of public religious administrative functions, amount of educated professionals. That is, of course, a major cause. The need, the demand for educated professional in administration, law, religious institutions. Cities need different regulations than rural areas. So there needs to be a new understanding of the law. There is a different situation health-wise, like hygiene, and, and how do we understand that? So because of the growth of the European economy, the European trade at the beginning of, 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 of the, the 11th century, cities grew. And because cities grew, the, the life changed and there became a different need for law, for medicine, for understanding human society. The need for knowledge from the past antiquity seems to play a part, but was not as relevant as a later in, in the Renaissance. I think that the past was something that people looked up to because that was mainly the sources of the religious understanding. But Roman culture as such, did not attract that much of attention from the beginning, I think. The most important reason seems to be, one of the most important reasons they need, seems to be the need for better trained professionals. Okay. So if you have used the discovery tool up till this point, you could ask your students, okay, we have provided you with some answers, some, some causes, and then you could use this tool, the sorting tool. And the sorting tool will allow you to drag the different causes onto a format. So the instruction here would be to decide for yourself what was the most important cause. So I have some of the causes mentioned here, but it's the emerging of the cities and the origins and so forth. So you could really use the source again, you could look at them. And the idea is, okay, can you Decide for yourself by using the sorting tool, which of the causes do you think was the most important cause, right? And so you could just select the source, read it again. And I would suggest my students to use the tool in such a way that the most important source should, the most important cause, sorry, should be as close to the center as it could get. So the farther away from the center, the less important the cause. So that's the second activity. Okay, you have discovered until the rise of the university and maybe even a bit later, also by the effects of universities on, on city life or European cultural life. We have discussed some of the causes. These are some of the causes. Can you decide for yourself which cause do you think is the most important one? And then the second question is, how did university life contribute to medieval societies and culture. So the second question is, how did university life contribute to medieval culture? So you could look back again to the discovery tool 
And I would like you to think about what do you think was the contribution that universities had on society and culture. So again, go back to the discovery tool and explore. While, while people fill in there, a very interesting point in the chat, she said, while you were showing the sorting tool, she said, yeah, but uh, then maybe you can discuss also with your students, uh, if you classify the causes on uh, what's more and less important. The question is also important for whom? For them, like in their opinion, for, for society, for the medieval society, for today's society. And I do think that that's a very interesting point. What I said is that I even think you could repeat the tool multiple times and ask students to sort the sources from different perspectives. So first, what they think is most important, then think you're a doctor. What would you think is the most important in that case? And so on. But what do you think? I think that it would be interesting to provide the same sources in, in different parts of the activity and indeed try to let students think about it. If you look from different viewpoints, what would be more important? I think that would be very, very helpful. I would also like to discuss with students, okay, if we could take one of the causes away, if we could, you could eliminate that from the equation, which cause would prevent the universities from rising? That would also be a very good uh, a very interesting question because then we might also try to make them aware that things in, in history often happen by chance or they're not, it's, it's not that this is the way history should have played out, right? So I think both ideas are very interesting. We, we could do a lot with the sorting tool and there are different backgrounds you could use in the sorting tool. Yeah. So I have now used the concentric circles because that would allow some idea of, of, of priority. But there are also, for example, backgrounds for the sorting tool that says which one is valuable and which one is not, which should be discarded, which one not. Um, you could look at that for yourself, but there are different backgrounds so that you could try to organize different sorting activities, which is very helpful. But yeah, looking from different perspectives to this problem would be very helpful. I see another interesting question from Mirella that asks, do you get students to do this activity in pairs and discuss it or to do it as uh, individuals? It, it depends on the classroom situation. I think working in pairs may help them. If, if the students are placed in class in such a way that you're using in pairs is, is not that someone does all the work and the other doesn't. I also taught several classes in which I thought that any discussion would become disrupted because there was a lot of different social problems going on into, into a class, then I would know that. But if you think your class is able to, that would be helpful, right? And then I would also always just try to say, okay, but first do it for yourselves and then discuss uh, amongst each other, which one is the, the better answer. So provide your own answers first and then discuss it with your, your neighbor to decide which of the both answers you have come up with is the best and then put that answer into the system. That would be my, my first solution. If I would be teaching online, I, I think I would not do that in pairs. I would do them separately because then I need to organize breakout rooms and keep them coming back from breakout rooms. And I think that if you organize one session of breakout rooms, that's okay. But in a classroom using different types of sessions with breakout groups, I think that becomes too, too complex. And then uh, students might easily lost, lose track of what is happening in class. Okay. See what people thought of this. Humanism, keeping up traditions and bringing forth changes. See life development through the education. Okay. A lot of humanism, literature, manuscripts, <laughs> Greek tragedies, especially the rebirth of classical studies. That's something that has been created. Education. Andreas is one that says splintering of the Western church, which of course is, is the name of one of, of the sources there, but I think that is a very interesting point to talk about with students, and we're going to, to, to look at that into a bit greater detail next. But yes, it contributed to city life, right? And to the birth of the sciences. It contributed to humanism, and therefore also the interest in the classical studies and the classical world, which of course led to the Renaissance. And I think that that's a valid point. But one of the points we might be discussing, and I think that the discovery tool would need some more sources for that that has not been provided in our own source collection but there is an idea that university life 
although it started out as a from cathedral schools, university life was was definitely Christian or church bound or church based, I should say. But in the end, it also provided with the intellectual force that started to criticize some of the elements in the church. So I think that is a very relevant effect of medieval universities because they started to allow for critical thinking, right? In the end, the critical thinking also became applied to, to church rules and to church ideas and to church customs, right? And both kings and, and church authorities tried to prevent that, right? But in the end, they were unable to, to, to do so. Now, we have talked about the causes, we have talked about the effects. If I would do this with students and they would have the time, I would like to go into greater detail in one source, but also to show you uh, a final part of the Eactivity Builder. And I have selected a part of one of my favorite books from the end of the Middle Ages, that is The Praise of Folly by Erasmus of Rotterdam, who is a humanist, who is not really a scholastic, but who in his own way criticizes medieval society. What I would like you to do is to go to the Historiana learning tool and I would like my students to do that, of course, as well, when I would teach and I would have the time. And I would like you to read the text. It's just a small fragment of the Praise of Folly. And you could use the annotation tool. I will uh, show you how that works to select those passages in which you say, okay, this is an idea that has been made possible by the research done or the, the scholarly work that has been done in universities. And you could do that quite easily by using the annotation tool, if you could see my screen, you click on that and then you could select a different part of the text and it would allow you to provide comments. So if you want your students to work with primary sources text, you can upload the text into the activity builder. So this is not a source that has been provided by Historiana, this is one I, I selected myself. And you could ask them to read them, but to analyze them as well. And to say, okay, this is the points that you need to look out for in the text. And please, every time you have seen something that reminds you of what has been said in the discovery tool, provide some annotation with that. So then you can compare, right? So I would like to ask you to go to page seven of the e-learning activity and read the text. And Erasmus is really trying, is really criticizing medieval society. And at what point do you think, okay, but this is something he could have only have said because of the work done at the European University. And I believe that is also one of the final questions. Yes. To what extent did this work depend on the education of those universities, right? So use the tool, see if you can Use the tool to provide some annotations. I'm also curious if you have read it, of course, before this webinar. If not, it's a great read, very, very funny, actually, but it's also something really uh, significant of, of European intellectual developments in the later part of the medieval period. Alternatively, you could use the highlight tool. I think, but that tool works in a slightly different way because you need to have an image to anchor some text at, and then the page is divided into halves. In one half, you have the image, and in the other half, you can copy paste the text from any source. But in this case, I also wouldn't have used the highlight tool because it would be twice the same exact text or a very useless photo of a painting of Erasmus and then the text next to it. But the highlight tool might be another um, interesting uh, tool to use in similar cases, because then yeah. you can highlight parts for students to explore themselves or students can make their own highlights. It depends a little bit, I think, on what you want to achieve. Yeah, I, I tried to incorporate that into the lesson up app, but that was not helpful as well, because then it was really small. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I would do if I really wanted to, to do that outside uh, as, a, as an activity on itself, I probably would use the smart board and Word, just simple old plain Word and just, you know, try to highlight that because then you can use a whole screen. But, you know, in this e-learning activity, this was the tool that I thought would work 
work the best. And of course, what's handy is that in this case, you can present the also with the highlight tool, you can present the text with already some annotations for students. So, I mean, I think this is a very difficult text. So for an activity developed for higher education, then I think it makes sense. But maybe for an activity developed for, you know, fourth or fifth year high school students, you might want to add a couple of definitions of terms or references. It reads quite well, but it's still Erasmus. So you might need some scaffolding for some students. I see in the activity that after each of the pages that we looked at together, there's a question page which asks yeah. the same question that is asked in the yeah. tool. And of course, you can add it to your My Historiana and then also play around with it. If you do, let us know how it goes. We're always curious about people playing around with the activities. And maybe also good to know if, if you decide to actually test it with students from your My Historiana, you have the possibility to share it with others or with students. And if you share it with students, then at the end of the activity, they will have a smaller airplane shape that says sent to teacher. And in that way, your My Historiana will collect all the responses, which is also interesting. So you can see in Erasmus's work that his critical thinking and his critique on church life strengthen each other, right? So he's a very, very keen uh, observer of, of, of entire cultural life. And, and he uses that critical thinking to argue that this is probably not what, uh, what, what Christians should do. So I think that, you know, by reading Erasmus, your students might get a better understanding what it means that university helped to criticize the church because that's quite abstract. But if you read Erasmus's observations, it becomes clear how this line of thinking is used to criticize the church. Now, if I would have used it in, in a classroom situation, at the end, I would probably try to reflect on the significance of this topic. And what I would like to do with my students is to refer to what we might see in, in modern societies that especially the sciences is becoming more and more mistrusted, right? Especially in, in the COVID crisis, at least here in the Netherlands, a small but very vocal portion of, of our society decided that, you know, the, the scientists were liars. They did not have all the entire information and what would we knew, what would we need? with those higher education and those higher researches. So I would try to engage my students in the idea, okay, well, what is the value of research, of higher education, education as such? And by discussing that, I would try to let them think about the significance of this development, right? Because what need does our universities now fulfill? Are they really useless or are we still having a lot of benefits of that? not only in medicine, but maybe also in history and other types of, of uh, academic activities. So by doing that in the end of the activity, I hope to come full circle. We have discussed the rise of the universities. We have discussed the effects of the universities. And now we might be able to provide a better understanding of why such institutions are relevant and what would be the relevance for today. I would discuss that in the same manner. So what I hoped I've done this afternoon is to show you that we have uh, some really relevant sources on the subject. You could use the sources to discuss also current issues by reflecting on history. And I hope to have given those of you who have not worked with Historiana until now an idea of what Historiana as an online tool might provide you with kind of opportunities. And I really invite you to use this activity, make it your own, but also create an Historiana account and start, you know, experimenting with the tool. But I think it really has some very good features that will allow your students to really engage with historical thinking online, but even in your own classroom without the need to do as much uh, preparation as I would have done when I started my career. So this is what, what I wanted to share with you. And of course, we're always very happy and very open to, to comments and suggestions because of time, I thought we would not go into that into greater details, but I would like to discuss with my students, at least that they have an understanding that complex societies need complex information and they need complex understanding, right? And for humans to 
develop the higher thinking skills. I don't believe that's something that we do naturally. We need some education to do that. At the same time, developing critical thinking, higher thinking skills also is in itself a factor in change, right? So developing university, developing education, be it lower education, if you can call that, and higher education, it also all, always leads to change. It always leads to new ideas and new ideas might be threatening, but at the same time, we need those ideas to cope, to function. So it's a double-edged sword. It has some, some great advantages. We need it, but at the same time, it will also pose uh, difficult challenges as well. Yeah, Mirella. You said something very interesting right now that you are seeing it as a complex history part. If you want to understand it, it's, it's very complex. But actually what we are doing on the Historiana is very simple because we are taking the parts and, and yeah. putting it together with only one part maybe. Yeah, uh, sure. So what is also maybe the point of this, what you said is after they finish with the simple tools, thinking of the simple positions or whatever, then you can have a discussion and talk about it from a, a higher view. You're absolutely right. And I think the great challenge is for me as a history teacher is I want them to understand the complexity. At the same time, often I, I self find it difficult to understand the complexity, but to provide them with an entry point into understanding that. So I need to simplify to let them understand that, but at the same time, then the complexity gets lost. So in order to understand complexity, I need to simplify. And that is something that, okay, to what extent do I simplify? And, and where can I provide some insight in the complexity of the, the, the situation? And I think that is still a very great challenge. I've been teaching now 20 years as a history teacher yeah. and still it's, find it very difficult. What do I, well, why do I omit? What do I tell yeah. them? What I do uh, and think that it's actually working mostly is when I start a new topic, I always start like only just shortly, five, 10 minutes or whatever about the big lines and what is really important. For example, university, church, and then going down and getting up. <laughs> I agree, but but then the question is still okay. But but what sources would I use, yeah. right? And for example, but Alicia made a very relevant comment. Erasmus is maybe one of the easiest writers to understand, but still there's a lot of terms they don't understand. So mm. would we provide different notes? But again, then the reading becomes complex in itself. Or would we omit terms, but then you know just do some injustice to the sources? So what do they need to have in sources and in information to, to get some idea of the complexity? And that's a question. It's just still something, it's something that I love doing, thinking about that, but I still don't have the absolute answers yet. Thank you so, so, so much for preparing this presentation for us. It's nice to also talk about higher education once in a while, because we talk mostly about secondary school education. It was great. Very, very inspiring. So yeah, thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon at another webinar. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much as a, as a participant for being here again. I think most of us have uh, had a long day of teaching and working. So very, very nice to see a lot of people here, you know, discussing history teaching. Very